Oh. Courtney, you're muted. I'll try that first. So anyway, sorry, I've been out of the loop a little bit. I've had like a snowmobiling accident and then I had knee surgery and then I had to help an uncle move out of the blue down in New Orleans. So anyway, juggling a lot, but now I'm back. I'm ready to hike soon. Not yet, but soon. But anyway, so I missed you all is what I really want to say. So should I do like here, I'll do share screen. You can share your screen. There you go. We see it. Oh I'm so proud of myself. Sorry. There you go. Um, like technology. Um, <laughs> okay. So thanks you guys for the opportunity to present today. I'm super passionate about this. So um, cut me off and then please write down some questions that you have. I don't know how to get rid of this bar here, but that's okay. So it's you guys fine. have, is that all right? Cool. All right. So um, just a real pre a little precursor. I love presenting at mom's groups, mops groups, uh, the information you see today. I love giving it out. There are so many things that you can do at home for water safety that don't require swim skills. So what I'd like to do is um, just put that out there. And then we also, I have this whole presentation where I bring an aquarium in with moving water and I've done it at Rocky Mountain Academy for like over a hundred kids. So we do like to talk to kids about our water risks in the area here. So keep me in mind for that, love doing it. So uh, what I wanna start out with today is really kind of defining, we are not just a basic swim school. We really want people to think about why we learn to swim because it's over 50 years. We really haven't changed. The industry hasn't changed at all um, in the in the thread of the foundation of swim lessons being pretty much feeling like if you know the four strokes, you can dive down, you can float, uh, you're safe. And what we're finding with statistics, as you'll see through the presentation, is that's not necessarily true. So what I did was I, I'm a research addict. I love thinking about neural pathways, age and stage, development. And I just kind of pulled a bunch of stuff together to create a different way of swimming. So let's see if I can get it to advance. There we go. So this is Denver. I'm going to play that for just a sec. Denver was in our program. <laughs> it's so much fun. Sorry. Let me see if I can just go to the next slide. Um, there we go. Denver. Oh, I'm sorry about that, guys. Denver was in our program. Um, he came in at eight years old. Uh, and he was terrified. He was clinging to the wall. So after almost a year that I just want to show you, that's why, um, that's what we go for in our program. We want kids to be able to do what Denver did. His dad came in and said, okay, you know, in less than a year, we're going to go to the Grand Canyon and we want to, we're doing a two week rafting trip, get him ready. And he was terrified of water. So that's what we aim for. So when, when we are, tr are teaching swim skills in our facility, in Evergreen, that's what we're going for. We're going for him using the swim skills he learned and the confidence in the relationship with water to be confident doing that. Um, and this is where I came up with the idea. That's what this slide is about. Basically, if this little toolbar would move, you would see if you guys have been to, uh, has anybody been to Mount Princeton, Princeton Hot Springs in Buena Vista? Yes. Yeah. This right here, I was sitting on that upper area, you know, like the kind of, and I was looking down one day and I was like, you know, in the swim program, I was already asked to teach swim lessons. It started eight years ago um, in Evergreen. I didn't plan on doing swim lessons. I was asked to start them at a pool I put in um, off Troutdale. And as I was sitting there all that time ago, I was like, what do I really want to teach? These parents are putting their faith in me and I'm not on board with the way I learned. So I looked at this pool and I'm like, we teach them here. However, we expect that they're going to apply it here. And if you look, um, and actually, again, the statistics are showing something different. So if we just take a snapshot of the stats nationwide, um, that this is last August, 2023, 
five to 12 year old saw 26 drownings, 13 were outside of a pool. So that's 50%. Once you get to 13 to 19, a hundred percent were outside of a swimming pool. So under the age of four, yes, the risk of drowning is a swimming pool, a bathtub within your home. But are we preparing our kids for over the age of five when they're actually going to be using these skills? And some of it's just using terminology, you guys. I mean, you don't even have to come to our program. If your kids are good swimmers and you're playing in the river, be like, oh my gosh, I see how you use that front crawl. Oh my gosh, I saw how you use your float for that. Just bridge the gaps, use the terminology. Do you see the eddy? Do you see the flow? Which one would you use to get back to me right now? Eddy or flow? Flow can be your friend sometimes. It's not scary. You just don't want to swim against it. These are some ideas. This was this down here was taken at Cactus Jacks. Um, around the same time, I was having lunch with a friend. Two older girls, the older sisters of these two boys, uh, walked over and they were kind of leaning over and looking at the river. There, they went back and the two little brothers came over and they were leaning over. This, what I like about this snapshot right here is that we tend to disassociate in the mountains in our community. And this is my biggest platform from water. We say there's no swimming pools in our backyards. So they don't swim year round. So they, so people will say, so we just kind of put off swim lessons, right? Or we don't really have water that you swim in. 77% of drownings as of last year happened and they were not even intending on going in the water. Fishing is now the second leading cause of death, of drowning, unintentional being like in drownings. Boating is still the first, but fishing is now second. So it's so important that you get those kids those skills. And the parents, I mean, not to fault them, but they were just sitting on the deck having lunch, not even thinking about it. But if these kiddos fell in, would they be able to flip on their back and yell for help loud enough for someone to come and help them? So uh, basically, this is just a little background. So I was a swimmer. This is me right here. Like that's how much confidence I had whitewater rafting when I was 12 years old. And you would probably think guess maybe about a week or two prior to that, I had just gotten a medal in either breaststroke or butterfly. I was a competitive swimmer from the age of five. I fell out of the raft that day. I was so overconfident and I bounced right out. And then I ended up being the one um, that had to be rescued. And at that point in time, what sticks with me is not one of those swim skills popped into my head to help me. There's a disconnect. So we teach kids to swim in a predictable setting and we expect them to transfer it to open water. It's almost like teaching your child how to walk and then all of a sudden the sidewalk turns into quicksand. So also, I love to put these stats out there. When an adult does not know how to swim or is not comfortable in the water, there is, an, there is only a 19% chance of that child being confident or learning how to swim. So it's really important that you realize what is your story with water? And when we ask parents this, the first lesson we ask our parents what their water story is and think about that. Like a lot of them will say, oh, I wasn't really a swimmer competitively. And again, they frame it towards the swimming pool. And when I say, well, what about open water? They're like, oh yeah. I went to the lake every summer at my grandparents' house and I love the water. So again, we try to open up that, uh, bridge that gap. Um, so all swim lessons are not created the same. I love this. Are we teaching in this, in this environment with an intention that they're gonna be these kiddos someday? And again, this is, a, I'm repeating this, but please keep in mind that 50% of drownings between the ages of five and 11, as of just last August, were in lakes. And that is consistent. The general stat, you guys, is that over the past, um, let's see, Mick, my friend Mick, uh, actually looks at drowning reports every single day. This guy is a um, a giant in the drowning prevention community. I don't know how he does it, but he keeps all the statistics of the reported drownings, what shows up in the news. Consistently over the past eight years, over 70 to 75% of drownings over the age of five have happened in open water. 
So what is our risk in the mountains? Okay. I've already covered the first stat that it's the second leading cause of accidental death in teenage boys. And that stat has been around for way too long. A lot, the new, as, as of the drowning prevention conference, national water safety conference that I spoke at last February, a bunch of my colleagues and I were, you know, we kind of started hanging out together and, you know, and uh, we, it wasn't, there weren't any presentations about it last year, but we all realized that next year, the presentations are going to be the biggest risk of drowning being confident swimmers, uh, swimmers that actually had had swim lessons were on swim team and have that overconfidence like I did. So uh, fishing, I, I've already covered these stacks, stats, but the one also to keep in mind is that 88% had no PFD or life jacket on. One of the things you can do at home is grab that life jacket that you're going to have. And we'll talk about the right one to get because there are wrong ones. There are wrong ones that will be more harm than good. That PFD or life jacket, you want to grab that and you want to make sure that your three-year-old nut can put that on by themselves and tell you it doesn't fit as tight as a hug. It should fit like a mommy hug is what I say. So, um, What's swim, swim skills versus uh, basic self-rescue? So what's the difference, right? When you're looking at your swim programs, when you're choosing a swim program, are they going with that traditional uh, kind of Red Cross, YMCA, kind of that basic swim skills? Um, and a lot of the swim school franchises, a lot of the reason they do this, guys, don't fault them for it. Like, it's almost like you don't know what you don't know, but you have to be able to systematize it in such an easy way that a teenager can teach it, right? So the intentions are good of, of the other swim schools. You just want to make sure that you're supplementing it in some way um, with that open water application. So what's the difference? Um, can, can the pool skills transfer to open water? We have found in our program they can. Guys, I just made this up eight years ago. I was playing around. I had like some guinea pigs. The parents let me play around with it. And it worked. And that's what gained the momentum to be what I'm doing today. It wasn't what I intended on doing. I was a technical swim coach who also wanted to do aquatic therapy. <laughs> so I didn't sign up for this, but I love it. Um, and what we were getting are time and time again, they're saying, oh my gosh, for example, that little guy, Denver, his mom took him to um, Hawaii. And he, we teach kids in our pool. We replicate what you do when a wave comes at you unexpectedly. Um, how to handle a riptide. So when you're, when Denver went to Hawaii, they were jumping over the waves and having fun. They turned around, a wave came at them unexpectedly. That term right there, those collection of words, Denver had heard dozens of times in our pool. When a wave comes at you unexpectedly, what do you do? And he would show us, you dive under it. You go under that current. And he would show us. So he knew that terminology. He turned around, a wave came at me unexpectedly. His mom got, got kind of wiped out and got brought to the shore. She looks up, turns around to see where her son is. And he's standing there and he's going, mom, go under the wave, remember? So they do transfer to open water. Life jackets versus swim age, you guys, this is huge. The puddle jumpers are so dangerous. There's an entire organization that is trying to get them off the market because of the children that have drowned in those. It's a huge drowning risk. If you have any laxicity in the neck, if kids are tired and they drop their head, they can easily inhale that water into their lungs. Um, so you're looking, as far as life jackets, the one, the difference, um, that you see between the ones at Walmart and the ones that we recommend, you want to look for a type two life jacket that has no inflation on the back. The back has absolutely no padding in it, but it does have a little head kind of like a padded headrest. And that padded headrest, basically what it's designed to do is when they fall in, the flotation is on the front and they have something behind their head, they auto rotate. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, so we had a quick question though, Courtney. What's a puddle jumper? Oh, a puddle jumper is where you see they kind of go across the chest 
And then they also have holes for those arms. It's almost like, um, you know, those um, inflatables for the top, for the biceps, where the biceps are, the top of the arm. Like, it's like that, but they added like this little kind of band across the chest. And it also- Instead a lot of, of people, a whole jacket? Exactly, instead of a whole jacket. Now, the other thing with the whole jackets, anything that puts them, if you think about it, that puts them in an upright position- is giving them a false sense of security. So we've had kids come into our swim program first day and they'll just be standing on our platform going, look, mommy, I'm swimming. And anytime they're in that, that uh, vertical position, they'll think they're swimming because that's what they've been told, mm -hmm. right? That's a neural pathway in their brain that has been clicked in that says, this is what swimming is. We try to put them in a horizontal position to float on their back. And there's a disconnect. They won't do it. That's completely unnatural for them in the water. So we have to overcome that, that neural pathway to create a new neural pathway. Does that make sense? Okay. And so the puddle jumpers are just a more like a dangerous type of life vest. It, yeah. The puddle jumper is a swim aid. It's a more dangerous one. And thanks for that. I'm going to put a photo on here okay. with a puddle jumper. Yeah, I also um, do ask what it is in the chat and I didn't know either. Oh, thanks. I'm trying to go fast because I feel like I'm taking up too much time. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so as far as that, if you guys have any questions about that, like I can definitely send it out. And our social media is really good. We flood. Um, we really are intentional about flooding water safety into our community through social media each week. So my general manager, Corinne, she has done such a great job of getting so many images, pictures, statistics, ideas, tips and tricks out there. So if you guys do follow our social media, you'll see a lot of this on there being repeated. Um, is there anybody, other questions? No. Okay. So, um, this is an interesting statistic that has popped up now. Um, world Congress on drowning came up with this. So this is, this is not specific to the U S this is worldwide that 66% of drownings had swim lessons or were considered good swimmers. And those would be fatal drownings. There's a difference between near drowning and fatal drownings. Um, near drowning is when, uh, basically, you have a drowning incident, but the person survived. What comes with that is um, similar to like a TBI, because the lack of oxygen to the brain creates a tremendous amount of disability in the neurological system in the body. So uh, why start swim lessons right away? We have a free swim lesson for two to five month olds, completely free. It's on Wednesday mornings. You don't have to come every week. Um but the reason we want to get kids back in right away is because look at this study. I love this study from Harvard. It's called Brain Architecture, which I think is super cool. And it says, look at just at two years old, look at what we have access to. As far as developing those neural pathways, this is consistent with fear. I'm, I have a kiddo who I started working with yesterday who is extremely fearful in the water at the age of seven, no fear experience at all but look at what's happened. Look at how long that child has been out of the water and how we, we have not quite half, but I would say we have about a third less access to create a new understanding of water as a friend and something they can trust and be empowered and respect and not fear. So we talk about a relationship with water. So how are you introducing water? Are, are you introducing it as something, oh my gosh, we have to get you swim lessons because you have to be safe because you don't want to drown. Um, or are you introducing it as this is some, an element that that is 70% of your body, 70% of the earth. You are going to be in it, around it. We want you to love it and enjoy it. We were meant to be in water. I have seen unbelievable miracles happen in healing in the water. And we tell our children and we transfer that. Please tell your kiddos, please own it yourself. If you have any issues with water, give me one hour with you in our pool, please. I would love to reintroduce water to you. Water should be introduced as something that's our friend and you can communicate with it. So we tell kids, like if you're moving and you're, you know, you get like, ah, and you're wiggling around a lot, you're telling the water you don't need its help. 
But if you do nothing and you go on your back, the water will hold you up. It will, you guys. Now it's not going to look like a starfish because that takes all that muscle engagement and your feet were not meant to float because your feet don't need air. You might look like a jellyfish and your kiddos are going to look that way too. And really dense, like I've had NFL players floating in my pool that said they could, or former NFL players saying that they couldn't float and only their shoulders were above water. I was told I could not float at a very young age because I had so much muscle mass from a, as a competitive swimmer with breaststroke and butterfly. So that took a survival mechanism away from me because I couldn't do a perfect starfish float for a certain amount of time. So please introduce that relationship with water. Water's your friend. You can communicate with it. So that's one example of how we want to transfer that. Parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system is how breathing is happening in the water. Parasympathetic is that nice, relaxed, chill vibe that you feel like it's almost autoplay. So when you get really, um, when we get jacked up, basically when we take that deep breath, or if you smack your kneecap, or if somebody surprises you, you take that sharp breath in <gasps> like that. That's a lung breath. There's two indicators right around our shoulder blades in between our shoulder blades and, and kind of your, your lungs there. And those two points get triggered to say something is wrong. That's sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. So how we breathe in the water is big. A lot of us have learned to blow those awesome bubbles in the water and you take that sharp breath in and they're so proud of their strong bubbles. <sighs> but we just triggered the sympathetic nervous system fight or flight. So it's really important that we take a nice deep breath in and then we exhale at least to three or five count. And that's what we teach our kiddos to do. That's what I encourage you just to teach your kiddos to do. Get into water and take three really deep breaths where they're exhaling and blowing bubbles with that three to five count. And again, um, we already talked about that. Are we talking, talking about water is something they have to survive or something they can trust? Survival will be something that they will react in the moment with fear. Trust is something they will react in the moment using empowerment, knowledge, and respect, right? The wonder of water is something that we, that I love talking to people about. Water is absolutely beautiful. So we do like, think about doing science lessons with them at home. Rocked up balloon is something that um, is one of the things I'm always asked to do when I speak at conferences. It's something that when I consulted with the Red Cross to redo their, uh, they're redoing their learn to swim. And I was chosen to be one of the consultants on that. Uh, when I consulted with them last year, um, they were trying to figure out how to put this in their programs. Basically take something that floats, take something that sinks, drop it in your bathtub, go out to a river, drop it in there, show them that water acts the same, right? What floats, the water's still going to hold what floats up, then take a balloon and have them put some of their air in that balloon, do it in the bathtub, do it in the river. It empowers them to know, oh, wait, the water will hold my air up. And then some tips for you guys to prepare at home, some things that you can do. Permission in a plan is huge. You guys need to be watching no matter what, no matter what. I don't care if they have a PFD on anything. Please have them do permission and a plan and watch them. Permission is every single time they go in or around water, they make eye contact with you. It becomes a habit. We have infants doing this with that do sign language at home. So even nonverbal, they can learn this. One of the best moments for me in the pool, I always get teary-eyed when I, when I talk about this after all these years, is we'll have like a 15-month-old, for example, 11-month-old. We'll have them sitting on the side of the pool and we'll be like, okay, one, two, three. And I am telling them, they, have, they know that I'm the one in charge right then. Their parent is in our lobby. And I'll say one, two, three, and they'll start to jump to me and they'll stop. And they'll, this just happened to me yesterday for the first time. So I really am emotional with this one little kiddo who's old enough to do it now. And he looked up and he said, mama, before that, what he was doing was he touched his eyes and he pointed to his parents in the lobby. Once he saw his caregiver, or whoever brought him to lessons point to their eyes, then he jumped into me. And that right there 
would have saved so many of the children of so many of the people I've gotten to know who I call my dear friends that speak at these water safety conferences and have organizations because they lost their child. They're like, oh my God, Courtney, it, that, that was it. That would have saved them. So please don't just, I'm not trying to be like, I'm all that. It's just such a logical, simple thing to do. The funny thing is we get stories time and again from our parents saying that their kids are now going, okay, mom, I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to play with my toys and they're getting their parents permission. And then they tell them their whole plan. And I'm going to play with my toys. And then when I'm done playing Legos or whatever, and then I'm going to come up and then I'm going to want a snack. They're learning to plan things out. So that's what the plan is. We want kids to think about how they're going to enter the water, think about what they're going to do in the water, and think about a safe exit in the water. Where is your safe exit going to be? Where are your parents? Where do you need to stay or get back to? And then um, the other part is read the signs and learn what the warning flags are. They are different internationally, you guys. A riptide warning flag is different in different countries. Um, and also uh, research what risks are in the area that you're going to. So get the gear, no puddle jumpers, type two PFD. We have one on display. I'm gonna have one at Bailey Days. I carry it with me everywhere when I present because I want you guys feeling the difference between the two. So I'll have both of them there. Um, and then again, talk about safe exits when you are not planning on swimming. When you guys are down getting, you know, I don't know, ice cream at 31 flavors down in Evergreen or, you know, you're just sitting at two dads and you're like, hey, you know, if you guys fell in right now or Aspen Creek Cellars, you know, Aspen Peak Cellars, you're, you guys say, okay, well, if you fell in right now, what would be the best way to get out? Or you can say, I spy something that I could reach to you or I spy something that would float or I spy an eddy, or I spy a flow. And then make sure that you have a water safety plan of action. Think about water on your property. In the winter, think about the when the water, when that snow melts, it creates a pond. It can create a puddle. Think about the ditch that's running in the back of your uh, property. Make a water safety action plan as a family in case of emergency before you go to the pool, before you go paddle boarding. And then summer camp is a big thing. This almost, we almost had a drowning at Haiwan last summer. Um, when you send your child to summer camp, I'll just give you the scenario of what, what happens. Um, I'm not gonna give you that scenario, but because uh, that hasn't been made public. But in general, what will happen is, let's say a five-year-old goes to camp, right? Their parent doesn't wear a PFD when they paddleboard. So, and their friends, the summer camp counselor, or the lifeguard will say, can you swim, right? Remember what I said about the puddle jumpers in a vertical position? Those kids believe they can swim. They will say yes. They will not put a PFD on them. Very few summer camps have swim skill tests. There is legislation coming out in many states to correct this. It is not in Colorado, okay? Because we are so behind the curve on drowning prevention and water safety in Colorado. So summer camp prep, tell your summer camp provider they are not allowed to go to a pool. They're not allowed to, um, to have their child in the pool without a PFD on. You think that those lifeguards and those camp counselors are going to be watching, but guess what? They all go to high school together and they all love seeing each other. So give them a break. Know they're going to be distracted because they're teenagers and put that PFD on them. Oh, this is a slide. This is why I do what I do. It drives me every single day. It's why we opened an evergreen, which is the worst place to open a business like ours with the overhead. Um, and uh, my son, I lost my son uh, four years ago. So I started doing the work I'm doing as if you remember eight years ago. Um, I was at a national drowning prevention conference in April of, uh, 20, of 2019, my first water safety conference. I got to know, I walked around and I talked to all the families that had the tables with people who had lost their child. And I said, I waited till the second drink ticket till they'd had a couple drinks. And I said, hey, I'm Courtney. I own a swim school. How do we let you down? Hey, I'm Courtney. I teach swim lessons. How do we let you down? And I took notes so I could continue creating a program that we have here in Evergreen now. 
Then ironically, six months later, I lost my son. So I dropped off the map and then I started showing up again because I can't do anything about how I lost my son. But what I felt like I could do is this. I knew water, I knew water safety. And if I could create something that would even prevent, even if one of the tips I gave you guys today saves your child and keeps you from waking up with that reality that I wake up with every day, that's why I do what I do. So uh, use me, abuse me, and let me present. I'm super passionate. Courtney, that was awesome. And this is so important. I'm 57 years old and I even had an incident two or three years ago. Just, I mean, I grew up in water. My parents threw me in the pool when I was little. Did water skiing, did lakes, did whitewater rafting, did everything. And even just, it was a two or three years ago, one of my best friends and my unofficial goddaughters wanted to go to just tube in golden on yeah. the plat. And it shocked me how quickly I flipped. My Tevas were on nothing but slippery moss mm. rocks under the water, lost the tube, literally, you know, and I remember feet downstream, you know, I know all of yeah. these tips and I literally was like, shaken and scared trying to get to the side you know I knew what to do but I was like this, no wonder you know they close this down all the time when the water's too high or something this is dangerous I could see how quickly even somebody that knew what they were doing would freak out when they're tipped unexpectedly in the cold water and I was like I need Thanks before for I'd ever go white water I mean, rafting again or things yeah I need some more refreshers or tips because yeah. I was like and that could so easily trip. if I would have hit my head when I flipped exactly. it would have been it you know yeah. that's why the type two is good for adults too and we do field trips in the summer and they're not just for our clients like we actually took take families out to Bear Creek Lake and we have paddle boards and we show them how to rescue their children. We actually go to Golden and we show them how to rescue their children in, we flip the tube with the parents, with their three or mm -hmm. five-year-olds in it. And the parents learn yeah. how to hold their child up because a parent's going to hug their child, Right. And you're putting their right. mouth in the water. So we teach them how to reverse that, put the child's airway up, how to locate an eddy. I mean, there's so much stuff that we do. Um, and you can sign up mm -hmm. for that through our swim school just to, we just need to know you're coming for those open water outings. We take our gonna... seven ups, white water rafting, clear, clear rafting, lets us get them out of the boat, mm -hmm. jump in, get in the river, have to get back to the boat and use all their swim skills in that river. Yep. So, so it's so that, important. That happened to me too. Yeah. Not long after I moved here, we did pinball, we did numbers, we did all of the whitewater rafting things. And then I went with some friends to the gorge and they strap a helmet on you and send you down the gorge. And, you know, we lost someone out of the boat. Of course, yeah. we grabbed her right back in. But I was like, yeah, I need a safety trip before I ever do this again. Yeah. You know. Because you do, you panic and when you flip and it's you not do. what you would expect. And foot entrapment is the number one cause of drowning and drafting and tubing when they stand up. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you get caught <laughs> instead of just going with the flow. Yeah. Thank you. That we wow. all, you have so many great tips here. Awesome. Everything we should be thinking about. Thank you so Thank much you for sharing me. it. Sure. Thank you. I've been stabbed. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> this one, this one.